In the book of Ruth, we find a story of rather ordinary people doing rather ordinary things in rather ordinary places. But in the midst of all the ordinary, we bear witness to the extraordinary, because God is present and active through it all. That is the hope for all of us in this Advent season. Surely God is with us. This content comes from Mercy Village Church in Barbersville, West Virginia, and you can learn more at www.mercyvillage.church. Golden Corral, remember that place? Remember the golden trough? Yeah, rest in peace. I agree. We had the distinct honor of uh, eating there the final week of its existence. We were traveling somewhere, just Sarah Beth and myself, and, and my parents took the kids to Golden Corral. We came back from that trip, and I forget which one of our boys it was. He says, Mom and Dad, you'll never guess where we ate. I mean, he was jacked. There's food, all the food you could imagine. I mean, just absolutely blown away by this place. Golden Corral. So we had hoped they'd never discover it, but they did. So then on their birthdays, we would take them there, because that's where they always wanted to eat, was at Golden Corral. And Abraham's birthday was the week before kind of everything shut down with the pandemic. I remember s- sitting there saying, if, if COVID's here in the U.S., we have it now, because we just ate at Golden Corral. <laughs> um, and of course, that was it for that place. I have a purpose, I promise. Remember that chocolate fountain, Right? That's a great, uh, great thing. And, and so that chocolatey goodness would originate from the top of the, the chocolate fountain. And then it would spill down, it would cascade over the tears of the chocolate fountain. And you could take your little Rice Krispie treat on a stick or whatever else they have, and you could dip it in there and it would cascade, saturating whatever it was that you, you had, right? And then the cascading continued, right, as you then would eat the food and the the chocolatey goodness, you know, on your taste buds, right? It's just cascading of of goodness. Now, that's silly. I get it. But today, as we go into Ruth chapter 3, we continue this Advent series together. We're going to see an outbreak of, of loyal love cascading over God's people. And it's beautiful. In fact, very specifically, we're going to see that God's loyal love cascades from Bethlehem's Redeemer, Jesus. And it cascades through the lives of his people to one another, the people in the family of God, and to the world, those outside of the family of God. God's loyal love cascades from Bethlehem's Redeemer through the lives of his people to one another and to the world. Father, today, what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Now, one of the things we got to clear up before we jump into Ruth chapter 3 is a little bit of a disclaimer. There are a lot of interpretations of Ruth chapter 3. There are a lot of understandings of Ruth chapter 3. You're going to have a man and a woman meet each other in the middle of the night uh, in a field secluded by dark. And in our first world, American minds, it's going to be easy to read some some sexual tension into this scene. So I want to speak from the very beginning to that. We're not watching an episode of Days of Our Lives today. It's not what this is. And Ruth is not Marilyn Monroe singing Happy Birthday, Mr. President, to JFK, right? Like, that's not what's happening today. For us to truly understand this, and, and this happens because of our first world American cultural understanding of things, we oftentimes will misread Scripture because we try to attach our own cultural understandings, our own way of looking at things to these passages. We have to read them in the context that we find them, in the culture that we find them. Earlier in the passage, it's already begun for some to feel like it's maybe a Disney movie, but it's not that either. We have to disconnect ourselves from our context and go into that context, but more importantly, we have to trust the characters, the folks who are in the story here. Ruth has turned her life over to Yahweh. 
She has acted out in the loyal love of Yahweh. The word is hesed, the Hebrew word that goes all through this, uh, this book of Ruth. And she has displayed that time and time and time again. She is committed to Yahweh. Naomi is committed to Yahweh. She's in a dark season, a dark night of the soul in her life, but that is her commitment. And Boaz is an upstanding man who is who's seeking to follow after Yahweh. And we have to read it trusting these characters. It's their hearts that are at the forefront of this entire book. The hearts of Naomi and Boaz, and in particular, Ruth. Their hearts are on display because their hearts point us to the fact that surely God is with us. He is with us and he was there in the ordinary life events that Ruth and Naomi and Boaz were experiencing there in Bethlehem. And specifically today, their hearts will point us to that reality that's on your screen. That God's loyal love cascades from Jesus, from Bethlehem's Redeemer. And it goes through the lives of all of his people to one another and to the world. So, so bear that in mind as we read this scene that can have some tension to it. First, we see Naomi come alive. She's back in the story. Verse 1 says, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, Ruth's mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? This is the first time, really, since she left Moab that uh, Naomi has taken the initiative. Naomi has been in a dark night of her soul because she's lost her husband and her two sons. She's come back into a community that didn't care for her as well as they should have. And she's been in a place of deep depression, quite frankly, deep sorrow, deep mourning, struggling to, to do life. But Ruth has rose to the occasion and has has cared for her during this time. But what we see in chapter 3, and the reason chapter 3 is one of my favorite, is because all of a sudden, all three characters, the primary characters, Ruth, Boaz, and Naomi, come to life at the same time. And it paints this picture of what the body of Christ, what the people of God can look like when they function together in mutuality. And what I mean by that is they're going to mutually submit to one another. They're going to mutually lead one another. They're going to mutually love one another and invest in one another and care for one another. Nobody's in this for title. Nobody's in this for uh, 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 position. Nobody's in this for influence They are in this for the sake of one another. And they all come to life in this moment to the loyal love of God, the hesed of our God. And they extend it to one another. It cascades down from God and it cascades out of their lives uh, to each other. Now, I say there's mutual mutuality here, because what you'll see is you're going to see women take the lead, you're going to see men take the lead. You're going to see uh, people who are older take the lead and people who are younger take the lead. You're going to see people who are poor take the lead and people who are rich take the lead. All investing in, in one another, all initiating these things to one another. Now, you have to know that, that there are biblical roles that must be conformed to. That that's, that's doesn't change. And there are cultural norms that they have to consider as as men and women and rich and poor. Those things influence their lives. But the overarching theme of life for the body of Christ is this. We're all equal in dignity. We're all equal in our need for Jesus. And all of us who have received Jesus into our lives are equal in the portion of him that we have received. He has given us all that he is. We are all equally indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. We are all equally empowered to contribute to the kingdom of God. We are all equally given the ability to give hesed to one another, loyal love to one another. Paul's letter to the Galatians, he said, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, what Paul is not doing is disregarding the differences that exist in humanity. He's not saying there aren't differences between genders, and he's certainly not erasing the different experiences that Greeks would have had than Jews would have had as they came into the church. 
And he's not erasing in our current culture the differences that would be experienced by people of different races and different classes. That's not the point. The point he is making is that there is an overarching reality in which all people, regardless of all these things, can find undivided unity within the loyal love, the hesed of God. And so Boaz and Ruth and Naomi are going to experience that in chapter 3. That in the loyal love of God, they find themselves together in unity, undivided. Undivided. That's the overarching theme for the people of God. That's what they're going to experience. There is a central reality so saturating of our lives, it should be, that race and gender and class and all of those things find their way up under it and we find unity together as the people of God. But sometimes, right, we feel more like Naomi did in the first couple chapters. We don't see the loyal love of God, not vividly. We're in a place of deep, dark depression, but now she comes out of it. And as she does, we see some lessons about the loyal love of God. Verse 1, we read, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you uh, that it may be well with you? Here's observation number one. Hesed, the Hebrew word for loyal love. Hesed inspires hesed. Loyal love inspires loyal love. Ruth has been loving Naomi for the first two chapters, and now that loyal love has inspired Naomi to respond. It took time. Ruth has been patient with her through her depression, through her mourning, through her grieving. But now Naomi begins to respond. But think back, where did Ruth learn it from? Where did Ruth learn? She's a, a, she had Moabite religion was all she had in her upbringing. But now she's experienced the loyal love of God and she's displaying it to, to Naomi, her mother-in-law. Where did she learn that from? She learned it from Ruth or from Naomi. She learned it from her father-in-law, Elimelech. She learned it from her husband, Milan. But she learned it through suffering and grief and death from her own mother-in-law, Naomi. God's loyal love had cascaded upon Naomi, had cascaded through Naomi to Ruth. And now, mutually, at different points in their life, they were there for one another to extend that loyal love in times of need. Loyal love inspires loyal love. Verse 2, loyal love's intentional. Look, she's got a plan. Naomi's making a proposal on behalf of Ruth. Is not Boaz our relative, she says, with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. We're going to see this play out, so I'm not going to describe all of what that is yet, except to say that Naomi is thinking about time, place, She's thinking who, what, where, and when. She's being intentional in her loyal love towards Ruth. Now, I'm not, I do this sometimes. When people are in pain or suffering or going through a hard time, I'll say, just let me know what you need, and, then I'll, and I'll, I'll help you out. But when I do that, I put the burden on them to figure out what it is that they need. Okay, so, so Naomi is going a step further. And again, that's better than, that's better. I'm not bashing that in the sense of like, it'd be like that's worse than being silent. <laughs> of course, go to people and, and, and offer yourself. But Naomi makes intentional plan for how she's going to, to, to help Ruth. Verse 3, wash therefore and anoint yourself and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he is finished eating and drinking. Hesed. Loyal love calls people out, calls people out of their mourning. Naomi has, or Ruth has been doing that for Naomi. Now Naomi is doing that for Ruth. What's actually happening here is Naomi's telling Ruth there's certain garments that she would have wore that would symbolize that she was a widow in mourning, having lost her husband. She says it's time to lose the widow garments. It's time to put on your garments that say, I am ready now to move on, to be married, to carry on with my life. I've accepted the reality of the death of my husband, Milan, and I'm moving forward. She calls her out to that in verse 3. And loyal love is bold. Verse 4, but when he lies down, observe the place where he lies and go and uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what to do. 
It's a weird plan, right? Culturally, even weirder. Men would pr- propose to women, and rich men would propose to rich women or women of some status that would bring more status to them. Native Israelite men would propose to native Israelite women. This was the norm. It's all going to get flipped on its head here in this scene. She's going to go to him at night. She's going to uncover his feet. She's going to lay down at his feet, and then she's going to keep her mouth shut. Naomi says, keep your mouth shut, and he's going to tell you what to do. But it's a bold plan. It's outside of the cultural norms, and therefore it's a it's a bold plan. It's impossible to know completely uh, what Naomi's thinking, exi- how this is going to play out exactly. But it seems likely that she believes this plan will result in a quick, emotionally di- driven, perhaps physically driven response from Boaz, right? Because he's in such a good mood to say, I will take you to be my wife. Maybe even that very night before God, he will take her to be his wife. But again, purely. Right? They didn't have to go to the courthouse and get a marriage certificate. All he had to do was promise to her that he'd be faithful to her and take her on as his wife. And then all that was available to married people would have been there available to them. In that field. In the night. Ruth was pure, or Naomi was pure in her intentions, but she was also bold in her intentions. And lastly, loyal love is selfless. Hear me say this. Naomi could use Boaz for some economic gain for herself. Uh, uh, Logan alluded a little bit to this last week, that Boaz had the right to take the property that Elimelech had owned, right, before he died, and redeem it back into the family. He could go to it, and he had the right of first refusal, if you will, to buy it back from whoever had taken control of that land while they were in Moab. And she could have leveraged her relationship with Boaz for that. But instead, she leverages her relationship with Boaz for the good of her daughter-in-law. She says, disregard the land. I'm not worried about my land being redeemed. I want my daughter-in-law to be taken care of. She's serving as a vessel of loyal love. And that's the beauty of God's kingdom, is that widows who are coming out of depression serve God's kingdom. That foreigners who are going through a season of barrenness, Ruth, serve God's kingdom. Wealthy landowners like Boaz serve the kingdom. A diverse group of people from all walks of life serve the kingdom by loving one another with the loyal love that comes from God. And Ruth responds. She says, all that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. So you see, Naomi take initiative. Now Ruth takes initiative. Ruth, by the way, the book bears her name for a reason. Ruth is incredible. God is the hero of this story as he is with every story in this book. Jesus is the hero of all of them, but, but Ruth is by far the primary character in this story. She is the one who is most deeply going to reflect the truth about who God is. His loyal love is changing her life holistically. Like every part of her is being changed by the love of God and her vow to Naomi, which was rooted in the love of God. This is driving her. She's going to display, already has, courage, risk, strength, initiative, boldness, creativity, and at the same time, gentleness, kindness, respect, submission. She goes in chapter 2, and she risks her reputation. Logan got into this a little bit last week. Boaz could have been like, by her bold request, he could have said, get out of my field. And, but she goes, and she risks her reputation and her safety to have the best chance of feeding her mother-in-law. That's what happened in chapter 2. She said, let me glean, not back here with all the other normal gleaners who go behind and pick up the scraps, but let me walk up here right behind everyone so I can get the good stuff. That's a bold request. And her gleaning of this barley, she takes that risk so she can feed her mother-in-law and care for her. She has a pure heart and a passionate soul. And all of it happens in the ordinary day-to-day moments of life, the good and the bad. 
Ruth is constantly wrestling with what it looks like to live in the love of God. What does it look like practically in every aspect of my life? And so what you see happen is this newcomer to Yahweh, right, is now shaking up a community of people who have always claimed to follow Yahweh. This is the beauty of new Christians when they come into the church and they they ingest Scripture and the teachings and the promises of God and all of a sudden they say, okay, well, if that's true, then I should act like this. And everybody's sitting around saying that's crazy, but they're not the crazy ones. We're the lazy ones. We're the complacent ones. She comes in and says, if the Word of God says this, if, if Yahweh says this, then why don't we live like this? And she just does it, simple faith of the newcomer shaking up those who had claimed to follow Yahweh forever. Watch it play out here again in in chapter 3, verse 7. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry. Now, he may have drank too much, but that's not guaranteed from this passage, by the way. He's likely uh, feeling good, but he's likely not drunk. Because his role that night is to protect this barley from anyone who would come in and and steal it. So he's not going to be like hammered, like sloppy drunk. That's not not what's happening in this, this passage. So when he had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain when she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. So he goes to sleep under the Bethlehem stars in this barley field outside of the city. And when he does, Ruth comes. She uncovers his feet and she lies down. Verse 8, and at midnight, the man was startled. His feet probably got cold, quite frankly. My wife thinks I'm a serial killer because I have to take the blanket and tuck it under my feet. Like it has to be under my feet and it's got to be tied up against them. I don't know. Maybe I am. I don't know where that comes from. Some of you, that makes you uncomfortable. For others of you, maybe you get it. I don't know. We'll take a poll at one point, some point. See what that... But so he wakes up. His feet are cold. And he's startled by her presence there. And up till now, Naomi has been... uh, Or Ruth has been doing exactly what Naomi says. But now she's about to flip the script a little bit. Now she's about to call an audible. She's going to improvise. Because here's what's happened. Naomi's primary goal is to in this chapter is to care for Ruth. She wants Ruth to be taken care of. And Ruth's primary goal in this chapter is to take care of Naomi. That's what she wants. So in some weird sense, their their desires butt up against each other, but yet their desires are for each other. And so Ruth calls an audible. She says, I'm going to step out here. He said, who are you? It's dark out there. She says, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Now, on first reading, you might not know what she just did. But she, in essence, just complicated the whole thing by bringing that word redeemer into it, by bringing that legalese into it. And what you'll see in chapter 4 is that there's an understood meaning to her request. She is saying to Boaz, quite literally, I want you to marry me and care for me. But if you're going to marry me and care for me, then you have to understand that you are taking on my same vow to Naomi. You don't get me. We don't marry unless you have the same level of commitment to Naomi that I do. She wants Boaz to be the redeemer of Naomi's property not just the redeemer of her in marriage. And it's a package deal. She says, if you are going to marry me, and she says, and I'll risk it all, right? You could care for me for the rest of your life, Boaz, and, and that would be great. But if it doesn't come with care for Naomi, I don't want it. That's selfless, loyal love that she extends in this scene. So she says to him, Spread your wing over your servant. And that should send you back. Um, well, by the way, this is true too. 
I forgot. Romans 12.10 says, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. And the reason I kept thinking of that verse this week is because that's what Ruth and Naomi are doing to each other. They're like in this competition about who's going to pick up the check, right? Like, no, I'm going to pick up the check. No, I'm going to pick up the check. Like, they're, I'm going to be the kind one. No, I'm going to be the kind one. But that's actually the one area of competition the church should be in. You see, the churches get competitive about a lot of things, and, that's, that's, and that stinks. This should be the mark of us. We should be the crazy people who are trying to outdo one another and showing honor. And that's where Ruth Ruth and Naomi find themselves in this. And so she says, "Um, I want to take refuge under your wings. That should echo back to last week if you were here because Boaz said to her, the reason you'll be blessed, Ruth, in this place is because you have taken shelter under the wings of Yahweh. You have come under the wings of Yahweh. This is the same Hebrew root word that she throws out to him now in that in that field. Cover me with your wings. But it's a word that's saturated with meaning. This is cool because it can also be translated blanket. In fact, in other translations, the ESV helps us because it translates it wings both times. Other translations will translate it blanket. And what that would be would be a traditional request, traditionally understood as marry me. Cover me with your blanket. So it has this rich layer to it. She's there in the field and she's cold. And so practically she's saying, hey, can you warm me with your blanket? Traditionally, she's saying, will you marry me? And spiritually, she's echoing back to his words in that field saying, hey, remember when he said Yahweh has taken me under his wings. It's true about you too, Boaz. Yahweh has taken you under his wings. His loyal love is cascading down upon us. Will you now extend that same love to me? Will you shelter me under your wings? So it's this beautiful, beautiful request. And with it, the care for for Naomi as well. And Boaz sees it for what it is. He says, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter, You have made this last kindness greater than the first and that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. He gets what she's doing for Naomi. He affirms that it is loving and he adds one more piece to it. He says, you could have gone after a young man. You could have gone after a man who was more wealthy than me. But instead, you turn to me because I'm the one who can do both, perhaps. Redeem your field and redeem you. You weren't selfish in your love. You didn't go after a young man or a richer man, but instead you went to, came to me. Boaz is old. Boaz is getting by. He has some wealth, but he's not the richest person in town. She comes to him with this request. And he calls it what it is. Has it, I, there's power in mutual affirmations of grace. We as the people of God should be looking into the lives of other people of God and and noticing when the grace of God is on display in their lives and affirming that in them. Hey, I see what you did there. That looked a lot like Jesus. And I want to affirm that in you. I want to celebrate that in you. That's what's happening here. So Boaz is inspired again by Ruth. We're almost there. We've seen... The, the, the loyal love of God cascade upon Naomi, cascade upon Ruth, and now it, it cascades upon, upon Boaz as well. It already has. Remember back last week. Behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem at the very beginning of chapter 2 and said to the reapers, the Lord be with you, and they answered, the Lord bless you. It's like starting your harvest with prayer is what that's like. He was a guy saying, we're going to start with the fact that that all our blessing comes from Yahweh. This would have been very traditional when the Jewish culture was at its at its height of following after God. But right now in the time of the judges, very few people were. This would have been a unique level of faith from Boaz. He's already mindful of following in the ways of God. But he can grow. And Ruth is going to call him out to grow even further. She's going to say to him, right, she's going to call out to him like we said when we were talking about Ruth, saying, let me glean in this, in this field in a more uh, effective way. And he responds not defensively. Who do you think you are, woman? Who do you think you are, Moab? He responds, right, because the truth of God can be spoken from any of God's children. Know that. 
It doesn't only get spoken by pastors. It doesn't only get spoken by men. It doesn't only get spoken by those who have leadership titles. The truth of God can be spoken by all of God's people, and the true people of God will receive the truth when it comes from any mouth. He gives a prime gleaning spot to her. He gives her water. He gives her lunch. He he sends her home uh, with all that extra food for her mother-in-law. I've been reading a, a commentary by a woman named Carolyn uh, James. She said this in there, and it just struck me. Logan alluded to this. The Levitical law required a field owner to save the edges of the field and the corners of the field, to not glean that for themselves, to leave it. You will leave the edges, you will leave the corners, and the poor and the destitute and the needy will come and, and, and have food for themselves. The letter of the law, Carolyn says, says, let them glean. But the spirit of the law says, feed them. This is what Ruth is drawing Boaz's attention to. Two entirely different concepts. Ruth's bold proposal exposes the difference. God's law creates a healthy conflict of interest for Boaz. At harvest time, God meant for landowners like Boaz to wrestle with such basic questions as, how big is a corner? How much will I leave? It didn't specify this many feet by this many feet. How big is a corner, right? I'm pretty small. I can make a pretty small corner, right? How big is a corner? How wide is an edge? How thoroughly do I want my workers to clear my fields of grain, given the fact that we only have one chance to clear it? This is my livelihood. I got to get it gleaned. How much will I leave behind for the poor? See, walking with God takes us into a sea of possibilities that stretch our capacity for sacrifice and our imagination for obedience, reminding us there's always more to following God than we think. Ruth calls Boaz, don't just follow the letter of the law, follow the spirit of the law. You're not supposed to let me glean, feed me and feed my mother-in-law. And he responds beautifully in chapter 2, and he responds beautifully again here in this chapter. It's interesting, too, that Ruth says, take the corner of your wings or the corner of your blanket and put it over me. She said, you gave me the corner of your fields. Now, will you give me the corner of your life? Will you care for me in that way? And he responds, and now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. He says, when you came in here, you felt scorned, I know. When you came in here, you felt like everybody was looking down on you, and they were. You didn't get the most hospitable uh, welcome, but know this. I've heard the people talking in town, and they see the loyal love of God displayed in your life now. He affirms her again. He says, you're a worthy woman, but there's an obstacle, he says. Now it is true that I am a redeemer, but there is a redeemer nearer than I. Boaz isn't the next in line. We're going to see all this play out next week. I hash it out this week. But he's not the next in line, and we'll talk about the law next week to redeem her. There's someone else in, in front of him. But Boaz isn't a quitter. He says, remain tonight, and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until morning. And next week, we're going to see him leverage his privilege. We're going to see him leverage his influence. We're going to see him leverage his knowledge and even shrewdness to make this happen. He's going to go after Ruth's request with all that he has. But for today, simply see the, the mutuality of the love of God's people for one another. Boaz, Ruth, Naomi. Naomi. Taking initiative, creativity, investing, mutually honoring one another, loving one another, and becoming these cascading uh, examples of the loyal love of God. It shines so bright in chapter 3. Chapter 3 ends with a cliffhanger, really. If you've never read the book before, she goes home. It says, so she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. She doesn't want the rumor mill to get started. And he said, likely to a few workers who maybe had noticed that she was there, let no one, let, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. He says, I don't want people talking about this. They're going to get the wrong idea. 
even thousands of years later, people are still getting the wrong idea about this story. And he said, bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. And so she held it out, and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. It's like anywhere from 45 to 90 pounds of barley, by the way. So she ripped, man. We needed her to help carry all the trash out whenever we were doing that work. She's ripped, man. She, so then she went into the city, and when she came to her mother-in-law, her mother-in-law says, how did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her, All that the man had done for her, saying these six measures of barley he gave to me. He said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. And that's the last you've heard from Ruth for the rest of the book. But you're going to see her impact spill out into the remaining chapter. She replied, her mother-in-law replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For the man, Boaz, will not rest, will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Naomi has confidence, even though the, the chapter 3 leaves us with a cliffhanger, her confidence is not primarily in Boaz, but in the hesed of God, the loyal love of God at work in him. We'll see that next week. Here's the point for us today. For true, loyal love to cascade from our lives into the lives of the world around us and into the lives of others here at Mercy Village Church, it must originate from another. It will not come from us. If you don't believe that, then you're not being honest. This very week, I have failed to love with loyal love the people closest to me. I've had to repent to my wife for failing to love her with loyal love. I've had to repent to my children for failing to love them with loyal love. I don't have what it takes to pull off the Boaz uh, way of loving. I don't have what it takes to pull off the Ruth way of loving. And I don't have what it takes to pull off the Naomi way of loving, not in myself. Which is why that loyal love, as it did for the three of them, must originate from someone else. How'd you do this week? Did you love your people? People in your life with loyal love? Did you love your neighbor? Did you love the uninvited people in your life? The the needy relative? The people around you with deep personal care and self-sacrifice and enduring commitment? This is why we don't look within ourselves for loyal love. But we do look to Bethlehem. We look to Bethlehem because in those same fields outside of Bethlehem, a thousand years later, this. And in the same region, the same region where Boaz lived, the same region where Ruth lived, out in those fields where Boaz and Ruth and Naomi had had played out this loyal love of God. In that same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill to men. Surely God is with us. He was there with Ruth. He was there with Boaz. He was there with Naomi, pouring out upon them Hesed, Loyal love that they could not originate in themselves, and it spilled out of them into the lives of others. Surely God is with us, and this baby boy, this fountain of loyal love, is born to die. More loyal love has no man than this but to lay down his life for his friends. But Jesus has bigger corners, he doesn't just lay his life down for his friends. While we are still sinners, Jesus dies for us. That is the power of the gospel. That sinners like me and sinners like you, incapable of living out 
loyal love and unworthy of receiving loyal love find in the manger in Bethlehem the one who can accomplish it for us. Jesus, the perfect Son of God, living a perfect life, dying a death on the cross, shedding his blood so that we can have forgiveness of our sins. If you're not a Christian, receive the loyal love of God today by faith in Jesus Christ. If you have questions about what that looks like, please talk to me. And child of God, linger in that Bethlehem field today. It's where we see the uh, Hesed, the loyal love of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz, and, and linger a little longer, a thousand years or so, and you see the first denunciation of Advent to the shepherds. God is with us, and following Jesus to another hill outside of another city, Jerusalem, we watch him die with his arms spread out in loyal love. This changes everything because God's loyal love cascades from Bethlehem's Redeemer through the lives of his people to one another and to the world. And so two questions, two thoughts, place yourself up under the cascading loyal love of God. That's the one that's the first takeaway we should have from this is what does it look like for me to place myself up under the loyal love of God? My prayer, and it's like a broken record, and it'll be a broken record till I die, is that all of us, myself included, will see the spiritual disciplines of this life, the spiritual habits of this life, reading the Bible, praying, gathering with the people of God, all of those things as opportunities to taste and see that the Lord is good. That we'll lose that idea that these are just checklists of legalism, that if we don't do them, we're guilty. If we don't do them, we should be ashamed of ourselves. If we don't do them, God's not going to love us. And instead, see them as opportunities to experience the loyal love of God. Might that be true of us? Because then and only then will that love cascade to others. And so, three categories today to think about as we close. Three questions Who's closest to you? Who are those people? Who are the closest people to you? Number two, who have you forgotten about? Who are the people in your life who are forgotten around you? Maybe it's a a group of people, poor, uh, destitute, widows. Maybe it's specific people in your life that you've grown distance from. And third, who are the most difficult people in your life? And then, how will I, how will you show that hesed? that loyal love to those people, to those closest to you, to those who maybe you've forgotten, and to those who are difficult to show it to. I can't convict you of any of that stuff because I each of our lives are unique, but it's my prayer that God will today. Father, thank you so much for your loyal love, never failing, never ceasing. Might we find our joy might we find our hope. Might we find our rest in you today. Might we be saturated by your loyal love in such a way that it spills out of us to others, to our children, to our neighbors, to our friends, to those around us who even are difficult to love. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to this feed wherever you listen to podcasts. We exist to experience and embody redemption and renewal in Christ alone. And we'd love for you to experience what God is doing as Jesus builds Mercy Village Church. Connect with us online at www.mercyvillage.church.